All right. So it is um, 11 uh, Pacific here in BC and 2 p.m. Eastern, and I believe it's 3 p.m. in Atlantic time zone. So, um, so let's get started. Thanks to everyone who's able to join the webinar today. It is our last Fresh Ideas webinar of 2018. So I'm pretty excited about the topic and that everyone is able to join today. Um, so folks will probably keep rolling in over the next few minutes. That's usually how it works with the webinars, but we'll just get started now. Just a bit of housekeeping to begin. Um, if you could um, go ahead and mute yourself, so there should be on your control panel a little picture of a microphone. If it's green, that means that we can hear you. Um, so if you click it and it's red, that means they're muted and we won't be able to hear you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm Christine and I am the Communications and Special Projects Lead with the Canadian Freshwater Alliance. And I am based in Kelowna, BC on unceded silk territory. Um, I'll also be recording the webinar today. So um, some folks asked about um, accessing the webinar after um, or people that wanted to come but couldn't make it at this time. So a recording will be made available. And just a quick, uh, a quick few words about the Canadian Freshwater Alliance. I know a few of you are new to our webinars or maybe aren't familiar with the Alliance. So our mission is to build, connect, and support freshwater initiatives across Canada. So we will work with all kinds of different um, folks, you know, and nonprofits, community groups, governments, businesses, First Nations, um, you know, just citizens, uh, to strengthen citizen voices and civic engagement and participation in protecting our lakes, rivers, and other freshwater bodies. And we're a project on the Tides Canada shared platform. So one of the things that we do to help the freshwater community connect and learn from each other is we host webinars. So we host a series called Fresh Ideas on about a quarterly basis, where we invite guest speakers to share about freshwater projects or research or case studies that they've been working on. So as I mentioned, it's the last Fresh Ideas webinar of 2018. Um, but there, if there's specific things that you're interested in for 2019 or you have something that you'd like to share, please let me know. Um, I'll put my email in the chat box in just a moment because um, we really want to know what, um, what people are interested in. So uh, the webinar today is optimizing wastewater, improving effluent quality from wastewater treatment plants. And we're very lucky to have two guest speakers from the Grand River Conservation Authority on the line today. Um, so we have Mark Anderson and Kelly Hagen. Um, so Kelly and Mark will be sharing insights about uh, the wastewater optimization program. And so Mark is the water quality engineer at the Grand River Conservation Authority, and he's been in that position since 2002. And he currently heads up the watershed-wide wastewater optimization program. He has a bachelor's degree and a master's from the University of Waterloo in chemical engineering. And he has, uh, he's been a member of the Professional Engineers of Ontario since 1999. And Kelly is the Optimization Extension Specialist with the Grand River Conservation Authority since 2014. And she's been involved in optimization of wastewater operations since 2011. Kelly's also a member of the Professional Engineers of Ontario and the Water Environment Association of Ontario. So Mark and Kelly will present to us for about 30 or so minutes, and then after the presentation, we'll have time for questions and discussion. Um, so if there's something that comes up, you can feel free to put it in the chat box um, during the, the presentation. And um, otherwise, you can wait to the end and either ask a question into the chat box or um, unmute yourself. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Mark and Kelly, um, who are going to share with you their presentation. So, Mark, your dialog box should pop up in just about a minute there. Uh, yep. Thanks, Christine. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Yes, we can. Um, good. Okay, great. As mentioned, I'm Mark Anderson. I've got Kelly Hagan here with me as well. And we are going to give you the 25-cent tour of the Grand River watershed-wide wastewater optimization program. Um, I'll start with a brief outline of the presentation. I'll talk about some background uh, and the vision for the program, some of the components and the basis of the uh, optimization efforts that we've been undertaking. And then I'll pass it over to Kelly and she's going to take over and tell you about some of the examples of uh, some of our key results, some of the challenges we've experienced and some of the successes. 
Um, just for those of you who may not be familiar, um, we are with the Grand River Conservation Authority. And conservation authorities, I think, are unique to Ontario. We are watershed, local watershed management agencies that deliver services and programs to protect and manage impacts on water and other natural resources in partnership with all levels of government, landowners, and many other organizations. Uh, the map shown here on the slide shows the 36 conservation authorities in Ontario. The vast majority of them are located in southern Ontario. Um, and you can see the Grand River is the big green one right in the middle of the Great Lakes and in the center of uh, southern Ontario. We are governed by a board of elected municipal officials or their appointees. Um, there are 26 members on our board um, and we are enabled and governed by the oh so creatively named Conservation Authorities Act, uh, which is an act of provincial parliament. Um, together, the conservation authorities are mandated to ensure the conservation, restoration and responsible management of Ontario's water, land and natural habitats through programs that balance human, environmental and economic needs. Um, so just to give you a little bit more uh, geographic context on where our watershed is located specifically, it's highlighted here in yellow. And you can see that we're located in southern Ontario, about halfway between Toronto and London. And the, uh, the dreaded 401 highway bisects our watershed right through the middle here, just south of Kitchener, between Kitchener and Brantford. Um, we're very close to Toronto and the Greater Golden Horseshoe uh, that incorporates uh, Toronto, Burlington, Hamilton area. Um, there's also a, a green belt between us and Toronto that uh, has limited development in it. So uh, for those people who can't afford to live in Toronto, our watershed is actually very conveniently located within commuting distance and there is a significant amount of growth pressure in our watershed. Um, there are 39 municipalities uh, that are either entirely or partly um, touched by our watershed boundary um, and representing about 1 million residents. We are the largest watershed in southern Ontario at about 6,800 square kilometers. And just for a little bit of context, that's slightly larger than the province of Prince Edward Island. Um, the river flows from Dundalk in the north about 300 kilometers all the way to uh, Port Maitland in the south where it discharges into Lake Erie. And um, our watershed makes up about 10% of the, um, the entire watershed area draining to Lake Erie. So we're a fairly significant input, particularly into the eastern basin of, of Lake Erie. Um, again, zooming in a little bit on our watershed, we have 30 municipal wastewater treatment plants that discharge directly into the Grand River or one of its tributaries. And they're shown on this map as the green circles. The, uh, the color and the size of the circles is proportional to the amount of sewage that was treated at those wastewater facilities in 2017. Um, in addition, we have four communities that utilize surface water from the river as a source of raw water supply for their municipalities. And those are shown in the blue stars. Um, we've got a couple of communities, in particular, the city of Brantford and the village of Oshwiken on the Six Nations Reserve. Those are the two blue stars down here on the southern part of the map. Um, and those, those communities get 100% um, of their water supply from the Grand River. Um, whereas the city of Guelph and the region of Waterloo get most of their water supply from groundwater wells, which is supplemented with surface water takings. Uh, and just to give you a little bit more context <coughs> in terms of the, um, the importance of, um, or the, the size of the sewage treatment plants relative to the river, the combined flow from all of the wastewater treatment plants upstream of Brantford um, can be in the range of about 10% of the flow in the Grand River at Brantford uh, during low flow conditions. In addition to um, serving as a drinking water supply. Hey Mark, um, I just wanted to jump in and I think that your slide seems to be stuck on the Conservation Authorities of Ontario slide and I think you're, um, you, you've gone through a couple more. Um, uh, okay, I'm just on the next slide there. You, sorry. 
Uh, okay. Are you seeing the slides changing at all? No, it's it's still on the Conservation Authorities of Ontario slide for us here. Okay, let's try to stop sharing this and start sharing it again. Sure. Okay, are you seeing a different slide this time? Yes, now we're seeing the Grand River Watershed slide. Okay, so this is the one I was talking about, um, showing the 30 sewage treatment plants as green dots and the four drinking water intakes as blue stars. Um, in addition to serving as a source of municipal water supply, the Grand River serves a, many num a great number of other um, values and functions, including um, obviously natural habitat, but also uh, supporting irrigation and livestock watering for agricultural purposes. Um, recreation is very important in our watershed for the residents of our watershed. Um, and a lot of people spend time canoeing and kayaking on the river as well as, as, well as hiking next to it, fishing in it and, and that sort of thing. Um, so it serves a number of other important functions and uh, needless to say, there's a keen interest in having high quality effluent discharged to the river system which leads us to our optimization program. Uh, are you seeing the next slide? No, we're not for some reason. It's not cycling through. Um, yeah, it's still on the Grand River Watershed slide. Okay, let me try something else then. Okay, so this one should show some text and an aerial view of the Guelph wastewater treatment plant. Can you see that one? Yes, that, now we can see it. Okay, well, hopefully this will work for us. Um, so the optimization program started in 2010, about eight years ago as a pilot project. Uh, a central tenet of the prog program is that it's based on voluntary participation. And it's a partnership between the Grand River Conservation Authority the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, the local municipalities within our watershed that own the wastewater treatment facilities, and the operating authorities. Uh, and in, by that we mean um, third parties who are contracted to operate the facilities on behalf of the municipality. And here in Ontario, the largest of those is um, the Ontario Clean Water Agency. It's a crown agency of the province um, that municipalities hire to operate their facilities. Not all of the municipalities in our watershed um, have contract operations, um, but some of them do, quite a few, num quite a few number of them do. Um, the optimization program is externally funded by agencies such as the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. And in 2019, 2018 and 19, uh, a majority of our program funding is coming through a federal grant that's being administered by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities through their Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program. So we have to give a little shout out to them. Uh, you should see the next slide, which is the water management plan. Yeah, it's, it's for some reason it's not cycling through. Mark, do you want me to just open up the slides and then you can um, tell me next slide? It might be. Sure, that might work best. Okay. For whatever reason, it doesn't want to cooperate with you. So I will just bring this over. And share my... Okay. So yeah, from slide number seven. Okay. And how is this? We can see that. Yep. Okay. Okay. So Go ahead. 
The water management plan. Um, it's important to recognize the uh, Grand River Watershed Water Management Plan, which was approved in 2014. Uh, that plan has a number of goals, one of which is to improve, improve water quality, uh, to improve the health of the Grand River, as well as reduce the river's impact on Lake Erie. Uh, the optimization program developed a number of voluntary targets for total phosphorus and total ammonia nitrogen for treated wastewater effluent. And we really focused on those two um, parameters in the effluent because uh, they're the ones that cause the most direct um, environmental impact at this point. Total phosphorus causes eutrophication both in the river as well as uh, algae problems in the lake. And total ammonia nitrogen uh, is to toxic to aquatic life, particularly uh, anything that lives very close by the uh, sewage treatment plant outfalls. So we targeted those two um, parameters in particular and developed some uh, voluntary targets which are much lower than, uh, than the uh, effluent requirements under the existing environmental compliance approvals for the wastewater treatment plants. Um, the wastewater management plan also recognized optimization as a best management practice or best value solution to achieve the goal of improving the quality of the Grand River. And we did some modeling as part of the background to the water management plan to demonstrate that um, if we could achieve the targets that we've established for phosphorus and the ammonia, then we would actually see uh, improvements in the Grand River. Uh, next slide, please. So optimization is a term that's thrown around and it's used in a number of different ways by many different people. So I just want to give you a little definition. And in our context, uh, what we're talking about is creating a focus on the performance of the wastewater treatment plant and the quality of the final effluent by establishing a goal or a target, um, utilizing the existing infrastructure and people to their fullest extent to achieve those uh, goals or targets, and then applying a, a logical uh, approach based on data. And the next slide, please. So a bunch of those concepts get rolled into the vision for our program, which is um, to ensure that we're using data to make good decisions at all levels of the organization to ensure that we're really taking advantage of all of the capacity of the existing infrastructure and the, uh, the people and, um, and resources available to us to produce a high quality effluent that will make a measurable improvement in the Grand River and uh, Lake Erie. The next slide, please. Um, strategic planning. So we have a small but mighty core team composed of uh, Kelly and myself from the GRCA, as well as Sandra Cook, who's my supervisor. We have representatives from uh, the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, as well as some of our local municipalities. We meet quarterly for two solid days, and we use a process called the nominal group technique where we generate ideas, um, concerns, and areas for focus for the program for the next quarter. We put all those together and we vote on them to determine which ones are the highest priority for the next quarter. Uh, and then we, are, the big thing that comes out of this two-day meeting is basically a list of action items that drives kind of the, the things that we'll be doing over the next um, three months. Next slide, please. Um, so our optimization program is really built around the concepts that were um, created through the, um, the development of the composite correction program. And this was, this is a program that was developed in the United States by the US EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. In the late 1970s and early 80s, uh, as a means for identifying the causes of poor performance of wastewater treatment plants and addressing those causes, uh, initially it was it was developed to um, to bring plants back into compliance with their discharge permits. Um, but we've since adapted it and and utilized the same concepts to um, to try to promote uh, achieving a higher quality of effluent uh, from those sewage treatment plants. It's really a systematic two-step protocol uh, for identifying and resolving performance limiting factors or issues at a plant. The first step is a comprehensive performance evaluation, which is a five-day uh, evaluation by an independent team of reviewers. Uh, and it looks at the performance of the plant, um, 
the maintenance of various components. We interview uh, managers and operators. Uh, we do a div div uh, brief review of desktop review of the design of the plant um, to identify where some of the performance limiting factors might exist. Uh, and then the second step is technical assistance, and that's uh, a more involved and lengthier process to try to address some of those um, those things that might be preventing the plant from performing as well as we think it should. Uh, the next slide, please. And so the composite correction program is really built on this um, concept of a performance pyramid where we've established the goal at the top of producing a good economical effluent. So achieving a high quality of effluent being discharged from the plant. Immediately adjacent to that is the operations or the operators who apply process control to the plant to achieve that goal. Um, and in order to achieve that, the, the plant has to be capable. And that really depends on three areas, the administration or management of the plant uh, to ensure that it's properly staffed and, and resourced. The design of the plant, obviously, the tanks have to be big enough and the pumps have to be the right size to be able to control the process. And then, obviously, the equipment has to be maintained in good working order. So the administration design and maintenance pieces add together to define a capable infrastructure or the plant. And then it's really the operators who apply process control on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that the quality of the effluent coming out the end of the pipe is uh, of a high quality. The next slide, please. So um, the main drawback of the composite correction program is that it was developed to be applied on a plant-by-plant -plant basis, making it very resource intensive. Uh, when we have 30 wastewater treatment plants in our watershed, and there are two staff here, basically Kelly and myself, who, who do this on a, on a fairly full-time basis. Um, luckily for us, there's a group in the United States that's been um, supported by the uh, United States Environmental Protection Agency. Um, and they've been developing an area-wide optimization program over the last 25 years or so, focusing on uh, drinking water treatment plants, but using the same composite correction program concepts. So we've looked to them for, for guidance and, and, um, and direction on how they develop their program and how we could use something similar in our watershed. And although the goals might be somewhat different in terms of treating drinking water versus sewage, um, a number of the concepts are, are the same. So we've been trying to adopt their area-wide approach using a similar model. So uh, on the screen here, you can see uh, three components of the model. Um, and all of our activities basically fit into one of these three boxes. And some of them kind of span one box or the other or, or all three. But we try to divide them up into, into these various components. So first off, in the top left, we have the status component. And these are activities that allow us to track the performance of the plants, the wastewater treatment plants in our watershed, uh, assess them against our voluntary targets, and prioritize them for follow-up. Then we move down to the bottom of the, the circle where we've got targeted performance improvements. And these are activities that we do, um, such as evaluations or one-on-one -on -one technical assistance with staff at, at wastewater treatment plants. Uh, to try to improve the performance of those plants and, and achieve the voluntary targets. We also do something called PBT, which is performance-based training, uh, where we are taking operators from a number of plants and trying to provide them with hands-on um, concrete examples of what they can do in their plants. Um, the last component, or the third component, is the maintenance one on the top right. And that really comprises things that we do to sustain the program. For example, establishing long-term funding, uh, the strategic planning that we do every quarter, uh, but also things that we do to try and integrate optimization concepts into our day-to-day -day business uh, and enhance or add value where we can, uh, such as giving operators uh, continuing education units for any training that they might be involved in. Um, the last piece on this diagram is the little arrow pointing outwards and we've labeled it knowledge transfer. And that's where we, uh, we're working closely with um, staff from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks through their partnerships branch to try to spread optimization to other parts of the province since we only work within our, 
our defined geographic area in the watershed. The next slide, please. Um, so just some specific examples under those different components of the things that we do. Um, we've produced six annual reports now where we gather information from all of the wastewater treatment plants in our watershed um, and compare them uh, to one another so that plants can sort of see where they fall relative to others in our watershed. Um, in terms of improving performance, we've done a number of optimization training workshops. We've done nine on-site evaluations of wastewater treatment facilities in our watershed. And we've been providing technical support to four of those wastewater uh, plants in our watershed. Maintenance activities uh, to maintain program support. We have um, been doing annual workshops with the operators and managers uh, in our watershed since 2012. And the most recent one was actually last week on Tuesday. Um, we also document case studies and we've uh, developed a recognition program to, uh, to recognize the plants in our watershed that perform really well and have been participating in the program. And I think Kelly's going to talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, the last part there is transferring those lessons learned to other areas of the province. And uh, we work very closely with members of the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Um, both through our strategic planning process, but also in our on-site activities and the workshops, et cetera, that we've delivered. And uh, they've been taking what we've been doing here in the Grand River and trying to move that to other parts of the province. Uh, for example, they've started a little pilot project with uh, seven plants in southwestern Ontario in the Windsor and Sarnia area. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly, and uh, she's going to talk to you a little bit about some of the things she's been doing. Thank you, Mark. Um, so annual reporting, um, this falls under the status component piece. And Mark had already mentioned that we have six annual reports compiled to date. And each year we collect data from all the treatment plants in the watershed. Uh, voluntarily, they are submitting this information to us. So um, we couldn't do it without all the, the great participation of all the um, municipalities. Um, all of those reports are also posted on the GRCA's website as well, if anyone is interested in taking a look. In addition to the annual reports, we also prepare individual summaries for um, each of the treatment plants. And I have an example of that is on the right side of the slide, just showing a screenshot of the summary for the Brantford treat treatment plant. Uh, the top left is showing a, a small table of per capita metrics, uh, flows and loadings and that kind of thing um, with values specific to the plant as well as textbook typical values and the GRCA median values. The individual summary also shows um, the plant flows, monthly average plant flows and their nominal design flow as well as final effluent, total phosphorus, and total ammonia nitrogen um, monthly average concentrations, um, in addition to the GRCA targets that uh, Mark had mentioned previously. And the small box on the right is showing um, some comments related to process and performance, as well as follow-up information. So we send this information out um, to each plant owner um, so they can use it as a reference. Next slide, please. So this is a graph showing per capita flow. So this is one of many metrics that we track and report on in our annual report. Um, so what it's showing is each of the treatment plants is listed at the bottom. And it's showing per capita flows, which is the liters of sewage per person per day going to each plant. So it's showing the values from 2012 to 2017 for each plant. It's also showing the typical range you would expect is between 350 to 500 liters per person per day, as well as the 2017 GRCA median value, which is uh, 332 liters per person per day. So collecting this information over time helps uh, plants are able to 
see how they're doing year after year, as well as compare how they're doing to other plants in the watershed. Um, next slide, please. Data validation. So this is another piece that we report on. Uh, for mechanical wastewater treatment plants, it's called a sludge accountability analysis. And what this analysis is looking at is a theoretical amount of sludge or projected amount of sludge that you would uh, produce at your plant based on um, loading rates coming into the plant and removal rates, and then comparing what you would expect to how much you actually produce, how much sludge you actually produce, so the reported amount. And if those numbers are within plus or minus 15% of each other, it's said to close. So if those numbers are outside of that range, then it's time to start looking at your data and maybe start asking some questions. Um, similarly, we have a metric for lagoons. It's called a water balance that we've been working to develop. And that looks at the area of the lagoon, um, net precipitation, as well as the flow in and out of the lagoon. So this is a really useful tool for plants to kind of verify their own data. We started reporting on this back in 2014. So the graph on the right is just showing the number of plants reporting on it. And then the number in the middle of the bar is showing the number of plants that close within that plus or minus 15%. So 2014, five plants conducted sludge accountability. Three of those plants were within the plus or minus 15% threshold. And then jumping to 2017, 22 plants were conducting um, the sludge accountability analysis with 10 plants closing and two lagoon systems in the watershed conducted the water, the water balance exercise with two plants closing. Um, next slide, please. So examples of technical support activities. So this is what would fall under the targeted performance improvement component that Mark was talking about earlier. Um, so these are just some examples of activities that we do working with um, municipalities and operators. We'll have quarterly meetings, um, meeting with uh, plant operators, municipal staff, and that kind of thing. And we'll also conduct various special studies on site. So the picture on the right is one of the special studies we did at the Arthur Wastewater Treatment Plant, we were trying to estimate how much um, sludge mass was in a clarifier. We've also provided total mass control training. That's an operating approach to operators. We've reviewed various consultant reports and provided feedback back to the municipality. We've reviewed industrial discharge data, provided feedback on that. And we also created a daily data spreadsheet, um, which is a tool for the operator, which allows them to track and trend their plant um, process and performance data. Uh, next slide, please. So program impact. So this is a graph and it's showing the final effluent total ammonia nitrogen coming from uh, one of the plants we've been working with the Hespler wastewater treatment plant. Um, so the ammonia is the blue line um, and it's showing the ammonia from 2014 to 2018. The orange line is the GRCA's target. So um, it's two milligrams per liter in the winter period and one milligrams per liter in the summer period. So we initiated uh, a technical uh, assistance program in May of 2017, implementing a total mass control program at the plant. And you can see since we kicked off um, that program, the levels of ammonia in the effluent at the plant have decreased quite a bit. Um, we still have a little bit of work to do um, to work towards trying to improve effluent ammonia over the winter period, but um, so far it's been a really good success. Uh, next slide, please. Engaging municipal partners. So this is what would fall under the maintenance component. 
And one of the main things we do here is uh, the recognition program. So what the recognition program is, it's designed to um, promote and encourage participation in the program as well as um, highlight some of the top performers in the watershed in terms of um, performance. So we compare the effluent data that's submitted to us voluntarily from the treatment plants and compare that information with the voluntary targets that the GRCA has set out. Um, and since we kicked off this recognition program, we did see a significant increase in some of the self-reporting, mainly the sludge accountability analysis. So, um, so far the recognition program has been successful. Um, next slide, please. So watershed-wide performance. So the targets um, that Mark and I had mentioned previously are listed in the table on the right, this or on the left, sorry. This is uh, the total phosphorus target. So it's split into either 0.3 milligrams per liter or 0.15. So if the plant has a filter, then the target is set at 0.15 milligrams per liter. The graph on the right is showing the phosphorus flow weighted concentration. So what we're really looking at is um, all the treatment plants as a whole discharging to the river. So in 2012, we had a concentration of around 0.37 milligrams per liter. And by 2017, it was 0.3. So that's about a 19% decrease from 2012 to 2017. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so the table on the left is showing the targets for ammonia. So it's split into summer targets and winter targets. Um, so depend, so the winter target is higher, it's two milligrams per liter. And that's because nitrification, um, so the conversion of ammonia is uh, more difficult to achieve in colder months. And it's one milligram per liter in the summer. And then for lagoon systems, uh, the target is set so they can meet their, uh, so they're meeting their discharge uh, objectives. So the flow weighted concentration, the graph on the right, is showing the summer ammonia and the winter ammonia. So in 2012, the winter ammonia was uh, five and a half milligrams per liter, and it decreased 70% to 1.7 milligrams per liter in 2017. A similar trend for the summer uh, ammonia concentrations went from 4.3 in 2012 to 0.7 in 2017. So that's about an 83% decrease. So it's really good to see those numbers coming down. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Mark had already mentioned this briefly, but recently we've received funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities um, for the Climate Adaptation Partner Grant. So the focus of this grant is to improve wastewater management facilities to better face climate change risks such as flooding, drought, and extreme heat. We've partnered with five municipalities in our watershed. Um, they're listed on the slide, the region of Waterloo, Brant County, Centre Wellington, the City of Brantford, and Haldeman County. So this grant, it's split up into two phases. And the first phase is um, the part for 2018, and that's to uh, look at developing metrics um, to kind of characterize and quantify the impacts of inflow and infiltration on um, the project partner wastewater treatment plants. The second phase, which we'll be working on in 2019, is to work towards developing um, strategies to address those impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So this is an example of one of the metrics that we're looking at as part of that grant. This graph is showing uh, wastewater flows to the Fergus wastewater treatment plant and comparing that to uh, the drinking water production for Fergus as well. 
Um, so the water production is the green line and it's fairly consistent over the year. And then uh, the blue line is the wastewater flows. And ideally you would expect or would like those two lines to match up. So the drinking water flows going out to the system is what you would expect to be coming back to the treatment plant. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, the first six months or so of the year, um, the flows at the wastewater treatment plant are quite variable um, and quite a bit higher than the drinking water flows. Um, so we're estimating that is uh, likely due to inflow and infiltration into the collection system. Um, next slide, please. So program challenges. Effluent phosphorus loadings have not, uh, reductions have not matched the ammonia reductions. So we saw the two graphs previously, the, um, the ammonia uh, decreased quite a bit from 2012 to 2017, and we haven't seen that with the phosphorus. So there's still some work to do there. Staff turnover at small facilities has reduced the effectiveness of technical support. So working with staff, um, sometimes people move on and take that knowledge with them. So in some cases we have to start over in a sense. Review is required to verify self-reporting. So the data that's coming into us, more specifically the sludge accountability analysis is information that we need to um, do some QAQC on. Um, it's a very detailed calculation and a lot of assumptions can be made. So we still need to work on um, figuring out how to check that information. Program sustainability, including long-term funding, requires ongoing care and attention. So Mark had already touched on this previously, but the optimization program is externally funded and we have funding in place until about 2021. And municipal partners vary in their level of program engagement and capacity to support on-site activities. So some municipal members are very active and involved in optimization and um, other municipalities are very much less so. Uh, next slide, please. Successes of the program. So we've established voluntary effluent quality targets for phosphorus and ammonia for wastewater treatment plants. We've, de we've developed and implemented a strategic planning process um, to implement the program. We have six years of voluntary data reporting compiled into annual reports. All of that information is on our website um, if anyone's interested in taking a look. We've developed watershed specific metrics for plant loading. So the per capita flows and that kind of thing. Um, we have metrics on a local scale that we can use rather than going to the textbook. Um, next slide, please. The GRCA and some provincial and municipal staff are now trained in conducting on-site evaluations and providing technical support. Um, we've developed a recognition program to encourage participation and improve performance. We've also developed case studies um, that have documented how optimization can improve performance and capacity. And finally, uh, there's been an overall of 73% decrease in the ammonia loading from the treatment plants from 2012 to 2017. Um, next slide, please. And I just wanted to point out our website is at the bottom, www.grandriver.ca. If you search for optimization, you can find um, all of our annual reports and some case studies and other documentation um, if you're interested in taking a look. Thank you very much. Cool, great, thank cool. you so much. Great. Thank um, so we have some time now for some questions. So if you have any questions that kind of came up for you while you were watching the presentation, feel free to just put them in the chat box there. Um, and I see that there's one from Marlo already. Um, could you explain what a filter is? Uh, a filter is part of the treatment process. 
um, typically after the wastewater has gone through primary and secondary treatment. Um, some plants will have a filter at the end. Sometimes it's a sand filter and the water will pass through and remove more uh, solids from, from the effluent. Cool, great. Um, I actually had a few questions myself. Um, I was interested in the slide that you had about um, the influence of uh, precipitation events on, on outflow. So I'm just wondering, is there, um, in, in the Grand River watershed, is it mostly combined sewers or separated sewers? Do you have a sense? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, and the sewers in our watershed, luckily, are all what are considered nominally separated. So we don't have any combined sewers. They were not designed, the sewage stream plants aren't designed to treat stormwater. They're separate systems. Oh, okay. But you're still seeing an influence of kind of precipitation events in, in, into the, um, the, the wastewater inflow, I guess, or outflow? Yeah, that's pretty typical of every single system. Um, okay. There's always going to be some leakage. You're always going to get a little bit of rainwater and groundwater infiltrating into your, uh, into your collection system. Ideally, you want that to be kind of controlled and minimized, but you're always going to have some. Right. Okay. So it's just uh, the, the effect of that is tempered quite a bit with, with the separated sewer systems then. Yes. Yes. Okay. And just a, a question. Um, was wondering whether the, the flooding in the spring in the Grand River, if you saw a big impact that that had on effluent quality and, and meeting targets, and if there's any thought as to, um, you know, under the auspices of this program, um, whether, you know, you might consider, um, you know, measures to, to reduce storm-related inflows into wastewater, you know, whether through green infrastructure or kind of different measures like that? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. So just wondering if the, the flooding in the Grand River had any impact on, on wastewater kind of quality effluence um, right. in, in the spring. And then also whether or not kind of in addition to, um, you know, the, the focus on the treatment plans, if you're also considering, um, you know, measures to reduce storm water runoff, um, because it seems like there is definitely uh, that um, connection between extreme events and climate change, and that that could, you know, potentially temper some of the some of the really great results that you're seeing. So if you're thinking about, you know, green infrastructure or other measures to to um, reduce the impacts of stormwater runoff. Right. Uh, so to answer the first part of your question. Um, Yes, I believe almost all of the wastewater treatment plants in our watershed would have experienced some kind of higher flows or excessive flows due to the to the flooding event that we had in February this year. Um, whether that impacted on their performance or not, I can't say specifically because I don't we don't track performance on a day to day basis. Um, what we typically look at is um, data on a monthly average basis, and we wouldn't get that data until probably early next year for, for 2018. So we're not keeping track of it every month. We only report on it once a year. Okay. Um, so I wouldn't have expected it to have a huge impact or at least not a, a lasting impact. You might have seen some deterioration in performance on the day of, um, but given the extreme flow in the river at the time, the impact to the river would have been negligible. Right. Um, to answer your second question, uh, yes. Um, so Kelly mentioned the FCM project that the Federation of Canadian Municipalities uh, grant that we received. The first phase in 2018 was to evaluate kind of what's the scope of the impact of inflow and infiltration um, at a number of wastewater treatment plants in our watershed. The second half of that project will be in 2019, and that's really trying to look at what can we do about it to try to reduce those high flow events due to inflow and infiltration, which will be exacerbated by climate change. So phase two will be looking at 
what are some of the opportunities and and things that we can do to try to reduce the water from getting into the system? And if it does get into the system, are there things that we can do at the wastewater treatment plant level to deal with it better so that we don't see de degradation of the quality during those events? Right, cool. I look forward to, to seeing the results of that. Um, a question here from Marlo. Um, she says, it's a really impressive program. You folks are so far ahead of Winnipeg. We're working on some advocacy asking for a retrofit to Winnipeg's largest sewage plant, which does not currently remove phosphorus. So the phosphorus level in 2017 was 3.54 milligrams per liter for context. She says, I do have more questions. I'm looking to make a chart comparing that number to others. So looking for 2017 average phosphorus levels from treatment plant effluent from jurisdictions that use ferric chloride as part of their operations, since that's what we're advocating like Winnipeg should do. So not just biological removal, but also a combo of uh, chemical and biological. Okay, um, you should be able to find that information in the annual report on our website. Um, and it does identify kind of the average quality of the effluent coming out of the wastewater treatment plants in our watershed. And they all use uh, either ferric chloride or alum are the two common uh, chemicals that are used to control phosphorus. They're both, uh, I think, more or less uh, effective. It's just a a local decision whether they use ferric chloride or alum. Um, we only have one biological removal process in our watershed um, and they also add, um, I believe it's alum at that plant to reduce um, total phosphorus even farther. Okay. So great. yes, that information is available on our website. Perfect. And she's also wondering how, how you're getting buy-in and support from the municipalities. Well, the, the GRCA has had a long-standing relationship with all of our local municipalities. Uh, and for the better part of the last 25 years, um, we have been meeting regularly with members of our local municipalities uh, here at the GRCA to discuss water and wastewater issues that impact um, people up and down the watershed. So for example, Brantford is using the river for its drinking water supply, which is directly impacted by the region of Waterloo's sewage treatment plants. So we provide a forum and we have provided a forum for the last over 25 years uh, here at our office to discuss those types of transboundary, intermunicipal, upstream, downstream uh, questions. So there's, there's always been a great deal of buy-in uh, with our local municipalities and the GRCA. Okay, great. Yeah, I think the conservation authorities have been around since the, what, the late 40s, early 1950s, is it, Mark? Uh, the Grand River Conservation Authority, oh, that's a good question. I think we actually date back to 1939, if I'm oh, wow. not mistaken. Okay. Um, but the actual Conservation Authorities Act, I think, dates from the 1960s. Okay. Uh, yeah. Great. All right, so Robin here is asking, if you were setting up a water treatment system today for a northern community of 500 people, what type of treatment would you recommend other than a lagoon? Uh, that's a tough question without really going into a whole lot more detail. Um, and I, I'm not really a sewage treatment plant designer, so I can't say. <laughs> okay. No problem. Um, actually, another question about uh, treatment plants. So has there, has there needed to be kind of a high level of capital investment from the treatment plants um, in order to you know, participate in the program and, and work toward making progress on those voluntary targets? Uh, that's a good question. So one of the things we try to promote is utilizing the existing infrastructure. So trying to avoid spending a whole lot of extra capital to achieve the targets um, by using what we've got in the ground already more effectively. Having said that, that's not always possible. For example, at the Kitchener sewage treatment plant, they did have to do quite a bit of capital upgrades 
to be able to reduce the total ammonia nitrogen loading going to the river. Um, and that's just a matter of the infrastructure that was originally installed in the 1970s. It just wasn't, it wasn't up for the task. So they did have to replace a bunch of stuff to be able to uh, try to better achieve those targets. Okay. But ideally what we're trying to promote is utilizing what we've got more effectively. Right. Great. Um, if there's any other questions at all from the audience, I just have uh, another kind of silly question, which is, why is ammonia um, higher in the winter than in the summer months for, for wastewater? That's actually not a silly question, um, but it is, uh, it is removed through a biological process. And the bacteria that, that, that do that job are quite sensitive. They're particularly sensitive to temperature, so they don't work quite as well in the winter, which is why you see the uh, ammonia levels going up a little bit more in the wintertime. Okay. All right. It just has a function. It's a function of the water temperature and the fact that they just don't like to do anything when they, when they get cold. Right. Okay. Um, so Marlo has one more question. What happens if wastewater plants don't comply? Are they fine? I think it's a, a voluntary program, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right, Mark? Yes, it is a voluntary program. So if they don't comply, we try to publicly shame them back into coming <laughs> back to us. Right, no, that's I, that bronze, gold, silver. We do try to, exactly. We try to provide incentives and, um, and again, it's a voluntary program where we work with everybody, not, uh, uh, we have no, we have no jurisdiction to fine anybody. Right. We, we can't lay fines for anything unless you're building a house in a wetland or a floodplain. <laughs> right. And, um, and just to reiterate, so the Environment Canada guidelines for total phosphorus is about one milligram per liter and the voluntary targets under the wastewater optimization program is about, is a third of that, is that right? 0 0.3, yes. Okay. Right. Okay, great. Um, and in Ontario, I, I'm, I can't speak to other provinces, but at least in Ontario, each wastewater treatment plant also has what's called an environmental compliance approval. Uh, which is a legal document that outlines um, their requirements for the final effluent quality. So most of those um, most of those environmental compliance approvals in our watershed uh, will have a limit on total phosphorus of a one milligram per liter or less. Um, some of them are still at one milligram per liter. That's their their legal limit. Um, but what we're encouraging is. Um, uh, to achieve something lower than that. Okay, perfect, great. All right, I don't think there's any more questions from the, um, oh, Marlo is asking would the province enforce consequences then, um, but I think you just answered that. Um, yes, that the plant has an environmental compliance approval and if they don't, if the plant doesn't comply with the approval, then, then yes, this, the province would step in. Great. And then Zoanne is asking um, whether um, you can send info from to Environment Canada and have them or someone like them follow up because she's looking for better results. Sorry, I'm not totally sure I understand that question, Zoanne. So I'll follow up with you. Oh, it's answered. Okay, we're good then. Perfect. Well, if there's no more questions then, um, maybe we'll wrap up just a couple minutes early. And as I mentioned, we did uh, record the webinar. So uh, a few technical issues, of course, at the beginning, that's always how it works, but we uh, we managed to work it out and it was a great webinar. So, um, so I will be circulating the recording afterward um, and uh, to everyone who signed up. So, and if you have any questions for Mark or Kelly, uh, their emails are here. And I just want to thank you guys both very much. It was super interesting. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of watersheds across the province that are, um, you know, that are concerned about nutrient loading, especially, you know, heard a lot from the, the Lake Winnipeg Foundation where nutrient loading is a big issue, of course, Lake Erie watershed and, and elsewhere. So I'm sure it'll be very interesting to uh, all those folks that are working on, on nutrient related issues across the country. So thank you so much, Mark and Kelly. And thanks everyone who was able to join today. And um, I hope you guys have a great rest of the season. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch in 2019. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.